This video is an outreach of Unity Christian Church, 3500 West Hill Road, Flint, Michigan. I am Brenda Etheridge, pastor and teacher. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, the mission of Unity Christian Church is to lead people to Jesus Christ and to encourage one another on our faith journey. Bible readings are from the New Revised Standard Version and commentary is from the Agendon Preacher's Annual and Feasting on the Word. Editing and music from the public domain by Georgia. Our subject today is the new person in Christ. Our scripture reading is from Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 11. And it reads, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin that grace may increase? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like he is, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like he is. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed so we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is free from sin. But if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. Thanks be unto God for the reading and the hearing of God's word. Let us pray. Oh Lord, give us stout hearts to bear our burden. Give us willing hearts to bear the burdens of others. Give us believing hearts to cast all our burdens upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our scripture reading, Paul reminds Christians in Rome of their baptism. Baptism unites Christians to Christ so completely that we share in his death and resurrection. Our old self is crucified with Christ on the cross. And that death breaks the power of sin over us. We die with Christ. We are buried with Christ. And Paul writes, we will surely rise with Christ to walk in newness of life. Paul understands baptism as a type of as Israel once labored under Pharaoh, so humanity labors in bondage to sin. As Pharaoh's power was broken once when Israel passed through the waters of the Red Sea, so sin's power over us was broken when we passed through the waters of baptism. Israel came through the waters into the wilderness, a place for Fa where Pharaoh no longer held power over them. 
and where God traveled with them, but still not the promised land. Even so, we move through the waters of baptism into a place where sin no longer has dominion, where God is with us and where the fullness of resurrection life is still to come. The Reverend Wallace E. Fisher shared these words about our scripture. Our text this morning is from Romans 6, and it says, By baptism we were buried with him and lay dead, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead, through the splendor of the Father, so also we might set our feet upon the new path of life. During 14 of the Sundays in Pentecost this year, the epistle lessons come from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 5 through chapter 14. Today we focus on the Christian's new life in Christ. This phrase is used again and again in the church, especially in America. In fact, many of us have overheard it. Uh, we don't even recognize its radical nature. The phrase gets glided over uh, across our consciousness without stirring us to any critical thinking, serious faith, or grateful participation in Christ's ministry in the world. Most Christians are hard put to say plainly who the new person in Christ is or to speak intelligently about one's born again characteristic. Most who belong to the church these days do not belong to Christ. They're too busy ushering or going to meetings or fiddling with new programs and structures or raising money to repair old church buildings or construction for uh, an addition to a solid old one. It is not the intent of this sermon to demean the institutional church or the members who engage in these necessary but secondary activities. I'm simply describing the spiritual, biblical, and theological ignorance and shallowness of so many of its members. One can be in the church without being a new person in Christ. Well, that's obvious, but it's not obvious to many these days that one cannot mature as a new person in Christ without becoming a full participant in the fellowship. Here, if you are willing, Christ brings one's person to spiritual maturity through his or her disciplined response to the Redeemer in worship, prayer, meditation, and participation in Christ's ministry in the world. What then are some of the characteristics of the new person in Christ? What does he or she look like? Well, first, New persons in Christ look like they did before they were born again of and by God's spirit. Conversion, justification, and sanctification are not experiences that transform human beings from creaturehood into disembodied spirits who wholly pure Praise God all day long. 
in Christ through faith. We become new creatures, but we are still creatures. Finite, fragile, and erring. We still sin. We still fall prey and com contribute to the demonic forces that mar society. And like birds and beasts and redwood trees, we die. Serious Christ followers are saints, authentic believers, but also sinners simultaneously throughout our time here on earth. Being new in Christ is not human perfection. It is not a mystical experience. It is for us mortals, an earthly affair initiated by God and carried forth in responsive human beings. What makes those who are in Christ different from others is that our sins are forgiven. We are enabled to recognize and hate our ego-centered lifestyle, prompted and enabled to repent daily and renew our faith in Christ, motivated to serve Christ in the world and enabled to face death without fear, grounded in Christ's promises that his victory is also the victory of his faithful followers. What makes the new person in Christ different from others in Christ who is completing his good work in the midst of our sin-stained, hope-filled daily lives in short, our minds become increasingly operative in each believer in person through never, though never fully in this present life. Jesus is doing his work. To become a new person in Christ is an ongoing even costly affair for Christ and for us. It's not a out of this world experience. Jesus of Nazareth lived in full union with his father in heaven during his time here and now. To be in Christ is to journey inward daily to receive his gifts of forgiveness inner renewal and power in order to journey outward daily to exercise our new creaturehood and to participate personally in Christ's ministry in and to the world. Either journey without the other warps spiritual formation in an individual. Second, to be a new person in Christ is not a hidden miss affair that requires for us to give an hour or two now and then for God. Spiritual formation in the biblical sense involves one's whole person in, with, and for Christ. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus frames his claim for the believer's whole person in hard language. He intends to get the need for his priority placed into our soft heads and our hard hearts. Do not think that I have come to bring peace on the earth. Whoever loves father or mother son or daughter, more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. 
Jesus' call to new personhood is not tentative or relative. It's absolute and unconditional. In Jesus, God's first commandment, I am the Lord your God, means that one cannot place anyone or anything, parent, mate, child, vocation, class, nation, denominational church or sect, or above all, one's ego ahead of God. The first commandment can be discussed, debated, and accommodated to one's culture. Jesus' demonstration of the first commandment and his simple, direct, focused statement of its essential meaning gets under one's skin. It lodges in one's imagination. It requires really the gift of dishonesty to soften, erase, or confuse the meaning of Jesus' words. Of course, anyone can, and tens of thousands in the church do, ignore or reject outright Jesus' claim to one's whole person. To be a new person in Christ is to recognize, accept, and respond affirmatively to his claim on your life. It involves one's whole person, body, mind, emotions, and will. God's word addresses each person's private self, family self, and public self. Christ himself equips the private person to discern, accept, and fulfill its responsibility to family, church, society, and to God. Third, the new person in Christ orients to the immediate and the ultimate time and eternity. The serious Christ follower works for a more humane society for the sake of God's kingdom. Partially present in Christ here and now and waits patiently for its full coming in God's end time. The new person in Christ can mature fully in the faith by learning scriptures, double vision, time, and eternity. Faith's double vision of God's kingdom, partially present here and now in the abiding presence of Christ and God's kingdom yet to come in its full righteousness, love, justice, and glory. God motivates the new person in Christ to evangelize the world now and to work for a more humane society now for the sake of God's kingdom. These double visioned new persons in Christ also look confidently to that day when Christ will complete the good work he began in us. Most Christians today agree with Oregon, Oregon, an early church father, that Christ is the kingdom of God, already present in his power to forgive and renew us here and now even as he is the kingdom of God yet to come. To know him, affirm him, and accept his authority here and now will enable us to recognize him then and there, when, in God's end time, 
we meet him in his full glory. It is then and there that Christ will deal with his followers in the same demanding yet gentle way he deals with us here and now. Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The new person in Christ also recognizes and accepts it in its multiple guises as the dark side of biblical faith. The Christian also declares boldly, I believe. The Christian also prays humbly, help me in my unbelief. When Dr. William Rainey Harper, a one-time president of the University of Chicago, lay dying, he asked badly, why didn't somebody tell me I could become a Christian and settle the doubts later? God's grace does not cover our doubts but the notion that Christians ever settle all their doubts on this side of heaven's line is not biblical. Paul, whose faith inspires and intimidates us, acknowledged that his faith enabled him to see only a blurred reflection of reality. When Jesus lived in a body like ours in this fallen world, he experienced days of doubt. His anguish cry, let this cup pass from me at Gethsemane. And his cry of despair on Golgotha, my God, why have you forsaken me? are the lonely cries of every Christian sometime and somewhere. Wherever faith is, doubt is never far removed. In the mystery of the incarnation, God himself experienced the numbing impact of human doubt. It is the dark side of faith. It dogs all Christians until we join Christ in his kingdom. A thousand times a day, in ever-changing situation, every Christian declares and demonstrates his or her faith in Christ. And just as often, day in and day out, he or she prays, Lord, Help me in my unbelief. New persons in Christ are not starry-eyed ideal, idolist, idealist, religious sentimentalist, or whining co-ops in the on the hard journey into biblical faith. We press on for the high prize of Christ, praying daily, let the mind of Christ be in you. And when we pray that prayer, God does not disappoint us. Thanks be unto God. My brothers and sisters, Leave the good news of God's abounding love in Jesus Christ. By confessing faith in Christ before the church and others and being baptized into his church, we are given new life. Through faith and baptism, we receive life in the spirit. We invite you to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Commit yourself to his ways through the grace of God and the power 
of the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your most precious gift to humanity, your only son, Jesus Christ. In him, his life, his teaching, death, his resurrection, his abiding presence. You've opened to all who accept and affirm Christ as Lord and Savior, your household of faith, the church, in which we, forgiven and renewed, share in Christ's ministry in the world right now. We thank you for our place in this beachhead of your eternal kingdom of righteousness justice and love in our time and place. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of worshiping you in beauty and in truth. Give us ears that hear and eyes that see. Give us hearts and minds and wheels that are affirm and honor Christ's deed by acting daily on his commandments. We pray for those who do not know your son. We pray for those who only are mildly fond of him. We pray for those who deliberately live apart from him. We pray also for those, ourselves among them, who confess Christ in the world, yet neglect too often to do the deeds that demonstrate his presence here and now. Lord, look mercifully on all your people and you know they are legion in this tangled world of sin. Those who hunger, live in poverty and pain or oppressed are without hope are dying long and hard. Strengthen them and us now and keep before us Christ's promise that in God's kingdom, all tears will be wiped away. All injustice will be righted. Hope will be fully realized. Faith will be fulfilled and your love will prevail forever. Lord, we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, my brothers and sisters, go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people, love and serve God and rejoice in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now the, may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the union of the Holy Spirit be with each of us. Amen.